Почвам да записвам. Uh, welcome everyone. Today <coughs> our seminar is, will be given by Peter Ilyev. Uh, he has been postdoc in Liverpool and in France. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, uh, he actually is uh, sharing position with the Institute of Philosophy. So he's very interested person because he's, his background is in theoretical informatics, but he has a full-time position in philosophy and also a position in mathematics. So uh, let's hear from him. Well, thank you for calling me an interesting person. Uh, let me try to share the screen. Can you see it? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. It's everything fine. Uh, now it's full screen. Yeah. C can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's start. So, uh, judging by the audience, I think even I am in a difficult position. I see both experts in model logic and experts in other areas who don't do model logic for a living. So, in in such a situation, the speaker usually manages to annoy both the experts and the non-experts alike. So, the experts. Uh, usually want more technical details. Uh, the non-experts usually want an intuitively clear explanation of the problem, the, the main ideas, and less technical uh, de details. So uh, my apologies to both the experts for, uh, and uh, the non-experts, uh, to the experts for not including enough technical details, and to the non-experts for not including enough examples and intuitive explanations. But uh, the time constraints are such that uh, I couldn't do both. Uh, okay, what is descriptive complexity? Uh, briefly, it's an area of, you can say, finite model theory. And here's uh, Ronald Fagan, uh, one of the leading scientists in finite model theory. And uh, he says in this highly recommended article that uh, actually, uh, Uris Hurtmanis, uh, the Turing laureate winner, here is Uris. Uh, so he suggested the name descriptive complexity to Neil Immerman. And here is Neil Immerman. And uh, this, he wrote the textbook of the field. This is the textbook, also highly recommended thing. Okay, so what is the main motivation? Well, uh, uh, it's about basically uh, to attack the P versus NP question with purely logical tools, without thinking about Turing machines and uh, computational steps, but uh, about the, the expressive power of certain logics on finite structures. Another motivation uh, was uh, purely model theoretic interest. And we will be dealing with this one in the present talk. I'm not going to say anything about the P versus NP question and, and related matters. So the general idea is as follows. Uh, what we usually have in logic is uh, we have some um, semantic objects or semantic properties of semantic objects. Uh, for example, Boolean functions, uh, first order structures, second order structures, so on and so forth. And then you have some syntactic objects that you use to talk about the properties of these semantic objects. And usually uh, we have Boolean circuits and formulae, uh, binary decisions diagram, uh, first order formula and circuits, and so on and so forth. So uh, the descriptive complexity of a class of semantic objects or a class of properties of semantic objects uh, relative to a set of syntactic objects, phi, revolves around this question. Basically, what can we say about the, de the definability of the properties we're interested in with elements from uh, the set of syntactic objects we have? Uh, what we want to know usually is first, whether there is a formula or some other syntactic object that defines the whole class of properties we're interested in, or if not, whether there is a family of syntactic objects, such that each of these syntactic objects you see here, defines a subset or subclass of these properties, and the union of all these subsets or subclasses is the whole set uh, the whole class of uh, semantics objects we're interested. 
So in the first situation, uh, we, we can study how complex this uh, formula, primitive decision diagram or circuit it is. And in the second uh, situation, uh, we usually study how complex each formula or syntactic object is uh, and how this complexity scales with the index of the individual syntactic objects. So now, uh, how do we measure complexity actually? Well, uh, it, depend, it depends on the subject uh, at hand, on the problem at hand. Uh, if we're talking about a Boolean formulae, usually what we count what as complexity is the number of literals in the Boolean formula or the depth of the formula. Then uh, if we're talking about Boolean circuits, what we're usually interested in is the total number of gates, usually negation, disjunctions, and conjunctions, or the number of wires or the depth of the circuit. If we're talking about first order formulae, uh, what we usually mean by complexity is the length of the formula, uh, the number of uh, variables in the formula, the number of quantifiers, the number of quantifier alterations, the depth of quantifier nesting, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and similarly for model formulae and so on and so forth again. And uh, we are going to concentrate in this talk on model logics. Now, our model logics popular in formal verification, especially temporal logics. Knowledge representation, where well, we are talking about epistemic, deontic, sastic, descriptive logics. Then we have argumentation theory. Then we have mathematical linguistics. And uh, bluntly speaking, we use model logics to talk about and reason about properties of edge and vertex colored graphs, which are usually called relational structures. Here's an example. Here is a directed graph and the edges of this graph have been colored. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that uh, when we're talking about uh, colored edge colored graphs in model logic, we uh, explicitly stipulate that uh, each edge can have just a single color. It cannot, have, it cannot be colored with multiple colors. So uh, here we have one red edge and we have two black edges. Okay. And this is usually called in model logic Kripke frame. If you have a Kripke frame, you can build a Kripke model on it. And it's basically an edge and vertex colored directed graph. Uh, now, uh, here, the nodes one, two, and three of this uh, directed graph are, are colored too, but unlike the edges, the nodes can receive multiple colors. And uh, these are usually the propositional variables that are true at each node. So here we have uh, at node one, we have the propositional variable x3 true. Uh, here we have x1 true and x2 true in node number two. And in node number three, we have the propositional variable all the color x2 true. And this is usually called a Kripke model. Um, uh, the language, the model language we use to talk about these Kripke models uh, looks as follows. Uh, formulae are constructed out of propositional variables negation, disjunction, conjunction, and this diamond and uh, box operators. And I'm not going to give you the precise definition of the semantics of the diamond and box operator, but uh, I think uh, these the next the following examples will do the job instead of giving a full formal definition. Here's an example. Unlike a first order logic where you have just this global perspective on, on the models and the structures, in model logic, you are actually, uh, you have a local perspective. You're evaluating formulas locally at a single point. For example, if you take this Kripke model and you take point one, this one, you see that box R X2 is true. What you have to read by this is box R stands for everywhere you go along, along a red arrow, you will reach a point where X2 is true. Is this thing true in this point? Yes, it is because there is one red arrow. And if you make a step along this red arrow, you can go to a point, this point, the second point, and X2 is true here. Another example, take this point. 
point number two. So you see that the formula x1 and x2 is true because both propositional variables are true here. If you take uh, again point one, then you see that diamond uh, B x1 is true. If you meet, a if you see a diamond, you basically have to be the diamond as saying, you can make at least one step starting from the current point along a B arrow and reach a point where x1 is true. Can we make one such step? Yes, we can make a step from point one to point two again and see x1 is true. If we make this step here, x1 is not true, but we can make at least one step. So if you see a box, you should read the box as, as basically stating everywhere, starting from the current point and making one step along the arrow designated by the box, you can see uh, every point that is reachable along such arrows satisfies certain things. And the diamond says basically you can make at least one step along such an arrow and reach a point that satisfies what we care about. Okay. Uh, uh, another thing you should keep in mind is that you can look at uh, diamond I phi as an abbreviation of it is not uh, necessary that not phi. And similarly, uh, box phi is an abbreviation of it is not possible not phi. If we uh, have just a single color for the edges, uh, we usually write box and diamond without making the color explicit in the notation. And usually these pairs of a model and a point where evaluate, we evaluate the formula are called pointed models. So this is all you have to know for the purposes of this talk. Then we have another concept. This was the concept of truth uh, on uh, the previous slide. But then we have a, a much stronger concept, which is the concept of validity of a formula in a cryptic frame. And basically validity is, is uh, truth in every possible pointed cryptic model based on that frame. In other words, a formula is valid if and only if it is true in every point, in every possible cryptic model you can construct based on the frame. And uh, this is actually a, a fragment of the universal homodetic second order logic in disguise. Here's an example. This formula is valid on this reflexive frame. It doesn't matter how you color the notes here. This formula is going to be true in every note. It doesn't matter what the colors are. Okay, so we have two important definitions about the uh, model definability of classes of models and classes of frames. So we say that a model formula defines a class of pointed models, if and only if it is true in all pointed models in the class and not true in any pointed model not in the class. And then a model formula defines a class of frames. Keep in mind that we're here, when we're talking about classes of frames, we're talking about the concept of validity. If and only if it is valid on all frames in the class and not valid on any frame not in the class. Uh, the previous example was that uh, this formula defines a class of reflexive frames because it is valid on every reflexive frame and it is not valid on frames that are not reflexive. But not valid means that for every non reflexive frame, you can find a falsifying pointed model. How you find it is a completely different problem. So now, uh, when we keep these definitions in mind, uh, how do we actually prove descriptive complexity results in model logic? So, uh, as you guessed, uh, we can ask descriptive complexity results about model logics on two levels, on the level of pointed models and on the level of frames. So let's start on the level uh, with the level of pointed models. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we can say that the general idea behind the proofs here in this area come from Boolean function complexity. And the earliest paper I could find in which what I'm going to explain later first appeared explicitly is this one, a paper by Kahneman on proving lower bounds on circuit size. And it's from 1993. Uh, but keep in mind that I am sure that uh, the same tools or the same basic argument, the shape of the basic argument was used probably implicitly earlier. And for first order model logic, it was de developed in this seminal paper by Adler and Immermann. 
uh, where uh, the tools I'm going to explain shortly were used to improve some array results uh, in uh, temporal logics that were uh, obtained with the use of automata theoretic techniques. So Adler and Nimmerman were uh, able to improve these results that rely on automata, uh, very heavy automata theoretic machinery. They were basically able to improve it with what follows uh, now. So uh, you can find a description of the general strategy of the argument uh, that is used in such cases on the level of models, uh, for example, not on, but for example, in, in my last paper, which is called on semantically labeled syntax trees and the non existence of certain southeast formulae. And uh, I will give you the description of this general argument. So, uh, what you have is suppose we have a, uh, a class of pointed cookie models that is moderately definable. Uh, Again, just to remind you, modally findable means that there is a model formula that is true in all the pointed models in, in the class and false in all the pointed models not in the class. And we want to show that all actually defining formula, all actually defining formula that define this class M have certain complexity S. Now complexity can be length, uh, quantify alteration, uh, number of disjunctions, conjunction, uh, conjunctions, it depends, uh, it depends on the case at hand. But the general shape of the argument is as follows. So first we have to prove a lemma showing that for any two classes of pointed Kripke models, O and P, and any model formula that is true in all the pointed models in O and false in all the pointed models in P, the syntax tree of the formula can be labeled in a certain way so that every node of the syntax tree is assigned a pair of classes of pointed models. And these O prime and P prime are obtained from our initial starting pointed models, uh, classes of pointed models in a certain way. I'm not going to define what this certain way is because it's technically complicated and it will take a, a lot of time to do this. But the basic idea is, uh, first, what you have to know is, uh, this is the syntax tree of a formula. If we take this formula, for example, uh, basically, the way we pass it into a subformula can be made, it can be visualized by using this geometric structure that is called the tree of the formula. And um, if you have a, uh, the syntax tree of a formula, you can label it in this way, such that every node in this syntax tree of the formula uh, gets labeled with a pair of classes of pointed models, where the root is able uh, is labeled with uh, our initial starting classes of pointed models, and each such pair of classes of pointed models satisfy certain properties. Okay, and then we show, and here's the real difficulty in such proofs, uh, which is usually combinatorial and graph theoretic. Then we show that there is a class of pointed models, uh, a subclass of uh, pointed models A, and the class of pointed models that uh, whose intersection with N is empty, such that for any model formula that is, that is true in all the pointed models in A and false in all the pointed models in B, if this formula does not satisfy the complexity requirement, then its syntax tree cannot be labeled as described in the lab. Hence, we conclude that every formula theta that defines M must satisfy this complexity uh, requirement because theta is true in all the pointed models in A and false in all the pointed models in B. This is the general high level form of such arguments. Okay, on the level of frames, on the level of frames, uh, the general shape of the argument is much more complicated. And I think that uh, we first defined such argument in this joint paper with Andreas Herzig and Philip Bogini and David Fernandez Duque in our 2020 paper, joint paper. And uh, a different version of, of this argument uh, I made explicit in, in my current last paper. So uh, the previous argument, uh, the, the argument from our joint paper with Andreas Philipp and, and David uh, was a game theoretic one. Uh, I, I gave it a non-game theoretic version in my last paper and the non-game theoretic version is as follows. So uh, suppose uh, you have a class of frames that is not definable. 
in the sense that there is a model formula that is valid in all the frames in, in, in F and not valid in any frame that is not in F. And we want to show that all defining formulae actually have some complexity S. Again, this complexity can be a number of disjunction, a number of diamonds or boxes, so uh, I don't know, maybe model depth, whatever. So what you have to do is you have to show that there is a class, a, a subclass of frames A, uh, of uh, a subclass of F, and a class of frames B that uh, is intersection with F is empty, for which the following is true. Now, for any valid form, that uh, for any formula phi that is valid on all the frames in A and not valid on any frame in B, you should be able to find classes of pointed models a phi and b phi that contain pointed models based only on the frames from a and b respect such that for any frame uh, in a uh, this class of pointed models contains as many pointed models uh, based on, on each frame in this class as we wish, as we wish. and then uh, the other class of pointed models contains at least one pointed model based uh, on every frame from this class b and we have to uh, show that phi is false in all the pointed models in B phi. And then for any formula that is true in all the pointed models in A phi and false in all the pointed models in B phi, if this formula psi do not satisfy the complexity requirement we're interested in, then its syntax tree cannot be labeled as described in, in the lemma from the previous argument, from the argument of models. And if you manage to establish this, then you know that every formula of theta that defines this class of frames uh, should have this uh, should satisfy this complexity requirement. So again, uh, the difficulty here is for find is in finding uh, uh, the suitable classes of frames. Again, it's combinatorial and graph theoretic. Okay, so examples. Uh, usually. Uh, uh, such arguments uh, are especially meeting and uh, meeting in the, the case of epistemic logics. And what, uh, when I say epistemic logics, what you have to keep in mind here is that we are actually talking about uh, model logic in which only reflexive, symmetric, and transitive graphs are allowed. This is what you have to know about epistemic logic. And then we have again the usual formula, but this time this box diamond phi formula is interpreted intuitively as agent i knows phi is true. And the diamond i phi formula is interpreted intuitively as agent i thinks that phi might be true. So this is all you have to know. And this field of inquiry started with seminal work by Yako Hintiken, Knowledge and Belief. And um, why we uh, stipulate that we are working with only with reflexive, symmetric, and transitive graphs because Hintika said that if we're talking about epistemic notions, we have to require that uh, if we know something, that's, then this thing cannot be a lie. Basically, uh, you can believe a lie, but if we're talking about knowledge, then if you know something, this must be true. Then what uh, uh, another stipulation is that if an agent knows something, then that agent knows that it know that he or she knows it, and then if you don't know something, then you know that you don't know it. And if you stipulate that these uh, requirements be valid in your frames and models, then you are forced to work with only with reflexive, symmetric, and transitive graphs. This can be established formally, but I'm not doing this. Okay. And people, uh, so epistemic logic is a huge industry at the moment. And people have extended this basic epistemic language with many different operators trying to capture different intuitive concepts. Sorry. Okay. So the first concept that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that was introduced as an extension to, uh, to the basic epistemic logic was uh, epistemic logic uh, with the concept, uh, the notion of everybody in a group knows. So what we do here is basically we take the basic epistemic language with modalities corresponding to individual knowledge, and then we um, introduce another formula here, another 
operator. And this operator is basically, uh, you can think about this thing as an abbreviation of this formula. If you say that everybody in a group of agents A to N knows phi, what you're actually saying is that uh, agent I knows phi, agent B knows phi, and so on and so forth. So this is how I'm going to abbreviate this epistemic uh, logic that everybody knows as ELE. Then another notion of group knowledge was introduced, and this is, and this time it's somebody in a group knows. We introduce another operator, and somebody in a group of agents knows phi, basically means that either the first agent knows phi, second, and so on and so forth. So this time it's a disjunction here, here it's a conjunction. Okay, and then uh, we have probably the most popular epistemic logic nowadays, the public announcement logic. And the public announcement logic was uh, defined first in the seminal paper by Plaza, 1989. And uh, uh, in this paper, Plaza simply extended the, the epi basic epistemic logic with this type of formulae. Now, these type of formulae actually have very uh, complicated at first sight semantics. I'm not going to define it to define it completely formally, but I will give you an example uh, of the true definition of such a formula. So uh, when is a formula like this, the public announcement of phi, after we truthfully announce the public announcement of phi, uh, then uh, psi becomes true? Well, uh, imagine a reflexive symmetric and transitive cryptomodel. Let's take a point V. And in this point V, this formula is going to be true if first phi is true in this form, and if we uh, remove all points, all other points that do not satisfy phi in the resulting new model, in this same point V, psi becomes true. Now, as you can see, this is a, a pretty complex true definition. Here's an example. Here is your transit reflexive symmetric graphs. And what we see here is that in point one, agent B thinks that it is possible for X1 to be false. Why this thing is true? Well, because you can make at least one step starting from here along a B arc, like arrow, and come to a point where X1 is not true. This is this point three. But once we announce at this point that either X3 is true or X1 is true, then in this point suddenly becomes true that agent uh, that the agent B knows that X1 is true. Why is this so? Because if you announce this formula, you're suddenly throwing away the point number three and you end up with this point as well. Yeah? And in this point now, everywhere you go along, along a, a B arrow, you can loop here, you can go here, you see just a world that satisfies X1. So it's a pretty complicated semantics. But it turns out that you actually, for every formula that contains this public announcement operator, you have an equivalent formula that doesn't contain the public announcement operator. In other words, epi basic epistemic logic and public announcement logics are equally expressive. And intuitively, uh, the rules that give you an equivalent formulas, uh, formula like this, if you have uh, public announcement uh, phi, after the public announcement of phi x i is true, then basically this means that after truthful announcement, propositional functions do not change their true value. That is equivalent to this. Then you have that uh, two statements are simultaneously true after an announcement, if and only if each of the statements is true after the same announcement. Yeah, this one. And then you have that uh, a statement is not true after announcing uh, the state, uh, the statement psi is not true after announcing the statement phi. If an if announcement of phi is true, if the announcement of phi is true, then psi does not become true after the announcement of phi. And then you have this uh, rewriting rule here. So basically, if you're given a formula with public announcement uh, operators, we can start pushing these public announcement operators inside the formula until they appear in front of propositional variables only, and then use 
this thing to eliminate the public announcement completely. I'm going to skip this slide. So the, the problem was, okay, you have this fairly complicated uh, logic with complicated semantics. What, and suddenly this logic turns to be equally expressive as the basic epistemic logic. And uh, many people said, okay, what's the point? This is just syntactic sugar. Uh, why do we introduce such complicated syntaxes, uh, sugar? Why, why do we need this? And usually the, the explanation is, yeah, it is syntax, uh, syntax sugar, but uh, it's intuitively clear. Now, uh, arguments from intuition are not convincing for everybody. And um, things were not made better by this seminal paper by Carsten Lutz, entitled Complexity and Succinctness of Public Announcement Logic, where he proved that not only uh, public announcement logic and epistemic logic are, are equally expressive, but uh, they share the same computational complexity of the satisfiability problem. So basically, you cannot find a meaningful difference between public announcement logic and epistemic logic if you concentrate just on expressivity and computational complexity of the satisfiability problem. But uh, the other thing Lutz did in this paper actually was to show that public announcement logic actually is exponentially more succinct than epistemic logic. What this means is that he used basically uh, the first type of argument, the argument models uh, I sketched in previous slides to show that you have an infinite sequence of public announcement logic formulae and the lengths of these formulae grow linearly in the index of the formula here. Something uh, of the sort that the length of uh, phi n is not more than six times n. But the lengths of equivalent formulae in any sequence of uh, epistemic logic formulae, so uh, suppose that you have a formula that is equivalent, uh, epistemic logic formula that's equivalent to this power formula, uh, and a, another formula that's equivalent to the second one, uh, it doesn't matter what sequence of such equivalent formulae you get, their length is going to, uh, are going to uh, grow exponentially in the index of the formula. And uh, if we have such a situation, you say that the first logic is exponentially more succinct than the second one. And uh, uh, so basically, basically this, this says that, uh, yes, they're equally expressive, Yes, they share the same computational complexity of uh, satisfiability problem, but one of them is much more compact. Uh, you can express uh, semantic properties much more compactly with public announcement logic formula. However, there was a catch in his proof. Uh, to make his proof work, that, uh, and his proof was really difficult, uh, he needed to work with reflexive symmetric and uh, he, he needed to work uh, with irreflexive and uh, with graphs that are not reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So basically, he was going uh, outside uh, the models and the graph that were allowed in uh, epistemic logic. Uh, in a joint paper with uh, Bartelt Coy and Tim French and Viva van der Hoek, uh, we tried and managed to fix this. And we showed that even if we restrict our attention to uh, graphs that are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, you have the same exponential succinctness result between public announcement logic and epistemic logic. Uh, another result from uh, the same paper is that you have exponential succinctness result uh, between uh, epistemic logic, which everybody knows, and basic epistemic logic. And then uh, you have the same thing between epistemic logic, which somebody knows, and again, basic epistemic logic. Okay. So, uh, our, again, there is a catch. Now, our proofs work in the case where uh, when we restrict our attention to properly epistemic models, where, uh, that is graphs that are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. But uh, to make our proofs work, our formulae, the public announcement logic formulae, we have to talk about the nature four different agents and four different propositional facts. Now, Carsten Lutz's proof does not work on a reflexive and symmetric and transitive cooking models, but his formulae talk only about uh, the knowledge of two different agents and only one propositional fact. Now, proving uh, an exponential succinctness gap between uh, epistemic logic with everybody now, somebody else in public announcement logic and epistemic, basic epistemic logic 
on reflexive symmetric and transitive graphs, CRIPK models, with two agents and one propositional uh, practice, as far as I know, still an open problem. And it seems a really difficult one. I tried my hand several times at this and I could. And I'm going to skip uh, the slides too. And uh, these slides contain other uh, similar succinctness results. And I will come to uh, descriptive complexity results with respect to classes of frames. Uh, if you remember here, the second argument, uh, the second argument when we talk about uh, descriptive complexity of classes of frames is much more complicated. And I think it's fair to say that the first really systematic study of uh, descriptive complexity of cryptic frames was done by Dimitar Bakarev in 2003, Advances in Model Logic paper. And uh, before that, as far as I was able to ascertain or study the problem, it seems that before Bakarelov's paper, there was only one result about the descriptive complexity of classes of frames. And this result is this one. And it says that every model formula that defines the class of frame that satisfies this further or first order condition must contain at least two different propositional variables. And one such defining formula is this one. And I say at least two different propositional variables. I, I do not count uh, the occurrences, the different occurrences of propositional variables. Each variable must may occur multiple times. But what I claim is that, uh, what is claimed in this result is that every such formula will contain at least two different propositional variables, irrespective of the number of occurrences of occurrences of different variables. So here we have P and Q in this point. And you cannot define a frame that satisfies this first order condition with a formula, model formula that has less than two different propositional variables. So uh, there were no systematic tools that were, uh, we can use uh, to reason about uh, descriptive complexity of class, classes of frames. So we developed such tools in uh, our joint paper, I told you in the previous slides about joint paper with uh, Andreas, Philip, and David. And uh, we used these tools to prove the following results. Uh, here, this degree of M basically means a stack of M diamonds one after the other, and this means a stack of N diamonds one after the other. And uh, what we showed was that this formula, a stack of M diamonds followed by P implies a stack of N diamonds followed by P, is essentially an optimal model formula that defines this first order property. What essentially means here is that any formula, any model formula, take here that defines this property is uh, going to contain at least m plus n model operators and at least two occurrences of propositional variables and at least one boolean operator and uh, for the specialists here note that this result applies to classic uh, axioms like the transitivity the reflexivity and the density then uh, we proved a similar result uh, for the log axiom and again, we show that this is an optimal model formula that defines transitivity plus the second order property of converse well-foundedness. So uh, usually proving descriptive complexity results about a model formula that define uh, first order properties is easier than pro proving complexity, uh, descriptive complexity results about model formula that define second order properties. Okay, then we showed that this formula is actually optimal among those that define uh, reflexivity plus transitivity. And uh, this form model formula is optimal among all the model forms that define symmetry. And then we had the uh, central result of the paper was actually this one that uh, uh, for every natural number n, you have a formula in the line with the universal and box and diamond, with the universal box and diamond. And uh, the length of each such formula is of the order of n times log two n. And uh, you need at least uh, log two n variables. 
and uh, we showed that this log n2 variables are necessary, but we were able to uh, establish only a linear lower bound. So this is a quasi-linear lower bound here, but uh, a quasi-linear upper bound we have, but uh, we were able to uh, establish just a linear lower bound on the size of any such defining form. And uh, in the, this paper from 2003 that uh, I told you was the first systematic study of descriptive complexity of uh, cryptic frames, a bit of a kernel of conjecture that every formula, every Salkvist formula actually that defines this property, first order property that is called the uh, church Rosser four property. And basically, uh, intuitively speaking, uh, this property is something as follows. Uh, you have a, a frame where from each point X in this frame, if you can make a step along the arrows and reach two not necessarily different, uh, four not necessarily different points, Y1 to Y4, then you know that there is a point Z that is connected to all these Y points. So this property is connected, is definable by both this formula and this formula. For the specialists, this formula is not a Southeast formula because it, it violates a certain syntactic property. But this formula is a Southeast formula. And uh, the kernel of conjecture that there is no Southeast formula with two different propositional variables that define this condition. So uh, this conjecture remained open for some time. And in my last paper, what I did was to generalize Vakarilov's conjecture to the following thing. For every n, if we take the church rosa two to the power of n property, then we can show that there is no southeast formula with just n variables that defines this property. Keep in mind, however, that you have a southeast formula with two to the power of n minus one different propositional variables. And you have a formula that is not southeast with just n variables that define this property. But you don't have a southeast formula with n variables that define this property. So this was the main result of my last paper. And uh, the serious open problems, serious at least uh, according to the way I see things, is uh, first, at some point, I thought that actually, um, you will need for every n at least n minus one different propositional variables to have a southeast formula that defines the church Rosa property n. And, but I wasn't able to show it. So uh, my lower bound is logarithmic. And speaking of logarithmic lower bounds on the number of variables, it, it seems that it's a very uh, difficult question to resolve to find the classes of frames like this. Uh, infinitely many, countably infinitely many, and prove that the number of different variables that occur in any sequence of model formulas such that each formula defines the respective class of frames. So we, we have to prove that the number of different variables grow linearly here, grows linearly here in this sequence. This, this seems to be very difficult at the moment. And then we have the classic lemon scotts axioms. Again, this, this uh, degrees here simply mean uh, a stack of uh, M diamonds followed by a stack of uh, I boxes and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's still an open problem to prove that these formulae actually an optimal formula, uh, model formula uh, among those that define this first order property. So these are the serious open problems here in this line of work as far as I'm all aware. So oh, thank you. Uh, I just don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, these works, the works I, uh, I took part in are the only uh, works in the subject. On the contrary, uh, there, there, there are many works here, especially in temporal logics and uh, other people do uh, wonderful work. But I, I had to concentrate due to time constraints just on problems I, I was involved uh, with. So thank you. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? I, I see a raised hand here. Yes, uh, so. 
Or maybe not. I don't know. No, I also saw a raised hand, but uh, they. Uh, I'll ask one question. Uh, what do you think about your work? Is it a pure theoretical work or you look for some applications? No, I think it's purely theoretical. Okay. Because Gritter the Kerov, uh, maybe his work is also purely uh, theoretical, but uh, he, uh, the name of his dissertations was uh, Model logics for applications. So he was working for applications. Yeah, probably, but, but uh, his work there was completely different. Wasn't yeah, yeah. It? So I don't claim any uh, theoretical, any practical applications. Uh, having said that, uh, keep in mind that uh, succinctness results uh, have clearly uh, computational complexity uh, relevance. What I mean is the following. Suppose uh, you have the following exaggerated uh, um, situation. Suppose you have two logics. Doesn't matter what they are. Suppose they have practical application for these logics. Suppose they are logics that are used in formal verification. And suppose that both logics are equally expressive and have the same computational complexity of the satisfiability problem. But suppose that one of them is exponentially more succinct. Now, even if you have a linear uh, time algorithm for uh, the satisfiability problem, both logics, you may find an infinite sequence of properties that are definable only with very, very big formulas in one of the logics, but with very short formulas in the other logic. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, linear time uh, computational complexity is of no use, practical use, if the properties uh, of interest uh, you are trying to verify actually can be defined with only with very huge formulas. So th this is one way you can say that uh, succinctness results can have theory, uh, practical applications. Yes, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, if not, let's thank the speaker. Uh, I, I want oh, to. There is one, sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I, you didn't mention you you were accepting or not accepting apologies, but I have an apology. I was uh, I was late. Yeah. Uh -oh. But uh, I'm fully behind the choice of uh, PETA to uh, make this uh, formally required uh, seminar talk uh, a lecture. Yeah. Uh, and uh, And also, uh get us uh, help us uh, get to know uh, the uh, area he's interested in the hot topics or well hot is a bit too strong to say but yes, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the the topics of interest uh, which are closer to his focus and the ones which are closer to to the interests of the wider audience so so in part, uh, maybe I reiterate, uh, maybe I say something that Peter has uh, already motivated a lot more contentfully than me now. In part, the, what, what's been seen is a motivation for the existence of specialized calculi. Yeah, because a specialized calculi, calculus is what uh, helps uh, give the, uh, produce the suitable abstraction of a, an otherwise uh, unmanageably complex description so that you can reason about some of the properties in a specialized language. For instance, if you look at Rosanka's um, uh, huge definition, yeah, it, it's huge. It doesn't fit on the slide. It doesn't fit in a talk because it has everything in it. Yeah. Everything that uh, can be thought of. Yeah. Whereas if, if there is a specialized calculus that could uh, uh, soundly capture only some components, yes. then we get uh, a job for a logic which uh, can only express something and uh, the, 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 the logic is able to do its job, to complete its job. Yeah. So this is a very classical setting of abstraction at work yeah. and it's practical. Yeah. It's not 
this kind of theoretical that uh, uh, study that uh, you know one enters and never gets uh, able to walk back to 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 to, to the applications. So the applications are there. Of course, uh, um, to to really motivate the to to really justify that there are applications, there is another part of uh, of the team that we never had in the group, yeah, which is uh, uh, the one that's between customers, yeah, who who use software and uh, the theoreticians, and this is the programmers, and uh, it takes uh, those people, those this kind of people, to to justify that this is also practical, re practically relevant. I'm, I'm talking a very general picture, but uh, but succinctness, talking about succinctness, uh, complexity, you know, this is an excellent example of uh, the questions which are relevant to everything uh, in, in, in the study. Yeah, in, in the whole enterprise of, you know, uh, theory being a, a reasonable extension uh, a sound extension of everyday life activities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the um, for, for the comment. May? Hope you accept the apology for being late. May I say oh. something? Uh, because you mentioned uh, what I said. If there is nothing else, I uh, better. Vesselin, do you allow her to Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So first of all, I said it's a huge uh, recursive definition, and uh, most of it cannot be skipped. And I presented quite uh, only very few things I he didn't present it from the huge de recursion definition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm uh, using the uh, hugeness of your yes. so definition just... now in, in the positive sense of yes yeah. i just broke into uh poses with examples yeah so and but you whenever you examples yeah. Yeah. you'll feel that actually you need a next step and you, you never actually there is no such thing like a next step mm -hmm. uh because it's a recursive if you go back and forth yeah. the recursion here is such in this case that uh, you go back and forth it's a real well, no uh, recursive definition. Your your emphasis is on on com computability related things, but I was just uh, interested to use the hugeness of the definition of as an example of, you know, how many features you may have to consider when uh, trying to do a, a really exhaustive uh, description of something. Ah, yeah, actually, yeah, it's all. a very yeah. good point that you are pointing exactly for model logic. So, Ask exactly for so model this is model. where specialized calculus leave, calculi yes. leave. So actually, this theory, and Muskovaki shows it for the simply typed uh, um, uh, Schoenfinkeling uh, coding. Actually, this theory, the one that I presented the last time, it doesn't deny neither Muskovaki's recursion. None of them denies model logic. And it is very nice open task somebody it's actually for a task for a, not for a master degree or for advanced phd or for a researcher for peter and for demeter gala um, so actually it's a very pleasant task to define the model operators because the theory allows inside of the theory without going necessarily to the model theory inside of the syntactic in the formal language to investigate the relations between the model operators and time, time locations. So it is all just the theory allows explicit syntactical description or representation of propositional um, uh, expressions their expressions, I don't say statements, yeah. propositions or impulse or types in, that include specific times or parameters for times, like variables for times. And then you define model operator and inside of the formal language, some of what uh, here you represent, for example, necessary involves for every 
in the model, here you have a language to bring them together in one formal language. This is open task. Muskovakis uh, presented it for uh, his theory. For Muskovakis recursion, he introduced some model operators and he shows that several different kinds of model operators can be defined to distinguish between Kripke and other various. I'm not expert in model logic, but that is very clear and I like it very much and I understand it well, very well. Very well expressed relation between model operators and times and locations. Oh, well, thank you. So are there any questions or any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, then let's finally thank the speaker. And, yeah. um, thank you very much. Yep. May, I, may I remind that we are to continue with uh, uh, our other mode of communication yes. by uh -huh. email in order to do the the uh, rest of the uh, meeting, this, uh, uh, the departmental meeting. But work 